mics on? Good. So first of all, I'd like to thank a few people. I'd like to thank all the people I don't know who organise feminism in London. I know what it takes to pull off something like this. And so thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to specifically thank someone I do know, Lisa Marie, who I know has done a heroic attempt. Incredible. And I would also like to thank my partner, who is here of many, many years, who proves every day that Freud was wrong. Biology is not destiny. Men are born true human beings. I'd like to thank him as well. And I would like to thank... Um, a number of women who have started Resist Porn Culture, Heather, who is sitting here, if anyone wants to speak to her, Lisa Marie and Magda. Where's Magda? Is she around? There's Magda. Okay, so thank you. And also, I just have to say thank you to my dear, dear friends from Norway who I didn't know were coming, and I'm so delighted to see you all, so thank you. And if you ever want to meet real kick-ass feminists, it's this group, as well as you lot. So... Let's begin the talk. So I argue, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to put the radical back in feminism. When I joined a movement 20 odd years ago, we never heard the word empowerment. You know why? We only talked in terms of liberation. So what we're going to talk about is how did we go in one generation from talking about liberation, i.e. you and me, to empowerment, which is really about, if I'm okay, fuck you. So we're going to discuss how this happened. Let's remember what feminism used to look like. This is from Barbara Smith, and this was the first ever real book in America that was written mainly by African Americans. It was mainly by feminists of colour, but African Americans were the dominant group. And if anyone knows anything about America, race, as well as gender and class, is a major fault line in the United States. And Barbara Smith wrote, feminism is the political theory and practice to free all women, no, she didn't say some, she said all, women of colour, working class women, poor women, physically challenged women, lesbians, old women, as well as white, economically privileged, heterosexual women. Anything less is not feminism. So let's really think about what this means. Now, if we all want to weep to see where we've come to, we need look no further than Jennifer Bogarden's comment that feminism is something individual to each feminist. So I want to ask, how does one run a political movement based on what it means to each individual woman? For example... Could you imagine the labour movement is something individual to each worker? <laughs> How would one build a labour movement? Well, I happen to think that being exploited for $5 or £5 an hour is fine for me. And who are you to tell me to join a union to fight for higher wages? I mean, could you imagine what would happen to the labour movement? Or, let's imagine the civil rights movement. <laughs> which is the civil rights movement is something individual to each person. So let's imagine that. Let's imagine Martin Luther King standing up saying, I feel really empowered. <laughs> How far would we have gotten with that kind of approach? So this is ridiculous that we build a movement based on the notion that actually it is what it is to every individual person. <laughs> So let's talk about second wave versus third wave. And the first thing I want to say, you've all, everyone's familiar with this, the movement from the second wave to the third wave. Everyone talks about this as being about age. It's not. It's an ideological battle, not an age battle. Because there's many women here, I'm sure you will agree, that putting the radical back in feminism, you don't have to be over the age of 50 to believe that. And it has been sold as if, you know, are those of us who are a certain age, we're just so 2000 and we don't get it. And I would argue that we have to see the ideological backwards. <laughs> so let's look at what happened in the 1960s, because really to understand where we are today, we have to go back to the 1960s. And there really the battleground was between radical versus liberal. And what happened is, and I'm going to use this as an example, the feminine mystique came out versus sisterhood is powerful. And it's, if you look at those two books, this is where you see the real problem. 
Now, Feminine Mystique was written by Betty Friedan. And her problem was that she made certain assumptions. And her assumption was is that if women went out into the workplace, and basically competed with men, then we would have an equal piece of the pie. And <laughs> let's talk about this. What she didn't, first of all, talk about is which men exactly do we want to be equal with? Do we want to be equal with working class poor men? Or do we want to be equal with rich men? And I bet she was thinking of rich white men. The second thing she didn't realise is that men were not going to allow that. They were going to push back. They're not going to share their goodies. Especially the richer they are, the less goodies they're willing to share. So she had a kind of liberal perspective that believed that capitalism could accommodate the change in women. So what she said is this. Look, there's a whole view, and it looks very tasty. You have to admit, it looks very nice. So she says, the men have had all the pie. What we want is half the pie. Notice, by the way, how unappetizing half the pie looks <laughs> compared to the whole pie. And then she missed the idea that in fact we weren't even going to get half the pie because when you put together patriarchy, capitalism and racism into the perfect storm, women, especially women of colour, are bound smack in the centre of that. And white men are not distributing their goodies to those women. They are giving a few to their sisters. Has anyone read the book Lean In? Yeah. Everyone familiar? Okay, so this is really interesting. So this is basically, I think she's the head of Facebook or Google, one of them. So she argues that the problem with women is we don't lean in. Our problem is that we lean out, i.e. go and have babies and do things like that, and we lean out very early on so we don't get what's coming to us. So my argument would be this, if you are doing most of the shit work of capitalism, which is what most women do, for example, cleaning up after we leave, go and lean into your boss, right? Go and really lean in and say that you demand, as a woman, more power and you want more money. And what's he going to do? He's going to fire you. Right? That's the reality. So lean in is true for maybe 1% of the very wealthy women. You can lean in. Maybe I could lean in a little bit more. But to think that that is the answer to women's lives is leaning in and pushing forward is to basically, and this is what third wave feminism does, is it writes from the point of view of the privileged women. It assumes that their experiences can be extrapolated to all experiences. So. What happened is radical feminism came along side by side with liberal feminism and recognised that Betty Friedan's notion that men were going to happily give up 50% of the pie was absolutely <coughs> ludicrous. Now, why did they do that? They did that because radical feminism understood politics in a way that liberal feminism didn't because they came from the anti-war movement. And the anti-war movement in the US was actually developed an understanding based on Marxism and institutional power. It became very clear in Viet the anti-Vietnam War movement that this was not about Vietnam. Because most Americans had never heard of Vietnam, let alone where the hell it was, so why were you sending your young men over there? What it was was about economic power and America being the bully on the block. And they developed an idea drawn from Marxism that this is basically a battle about capitalism. And that capitalism is rooted in institutions. So, they took as their starting point a very key issue of Karl Marx, where he wrote, the totality of the relations of production constitute the economic structure of society the real foundation on which arises a legal and political superstructure. Now, I'm not going to go into all of this. What needs is key to understanding this, absolutely key, is that in Marxism, what he recognised is that systems work as integrated wholes, that those who control the economic means of production, i.e. the capitalists, they don't leave this shit to chance. They make sure they get hold of education and media and all the other institutions that reproduce the way we think. 
Because if you can control people via the brain and not the gun, because the Soviet Union was a perfect example of how inefficient it is to control people through the gun, what you do is you creep in through their heads and you get them to believe that their interests are congruent with the interests of the elite. And indeed, have men crept into our heads and set up camp? Of course they have. Women play host to our oppressor like no other group. We even cook them cakes and pies. I mean, how nice can that be? So, what did radical feminism say, okay? They said, let's go back to, again, another really important 1984 comment. By patriarchy, and this is where she's drawing from, capital, from Marxism, I mean the historical system of male dominance a system committed to the maintenance and reinforcement of male hegemony, i.e. power. Its institutions directly and protect the distribution of power and privilege to those who are male, apportioned, however, very important, very important to social and economic class. Not all men get the same goodies, we have to remember that. But what is crucial about this is she's not saying feminism is something individual, She's saying we are fighting here a structure of power that is embedded in the institutions. And you don't fight embedded institutional power by deciding yourself what you think feminism should be and how you go out and do it. The only way you fight institutional power is through mass movements. This is what feminism, again, used to look like, the feminism I joined. So that's her argument. So let's go back again, because I'll be on my mind, the pies and the very unappetizing half pie. And then let's say what some women have done, especially elite women, is that they have given up other women for the crumbs. They've sold out their sisters for crumbs. And those in power have basically joined, and not always those in power, but have joined to do the bidding of men. So what do radical feminists say about the pie? What do we want? Well, we certainly don't want the whole of their poisonous pie. We certainly don't want half of their poisonous pie. We certainly don't want the crumbs of their poisonous pie. What we want is a whole new pie. So, what we talk about in radical feminism is we have to rebuild the entire society from the ground up. We're not exactly sure what it'll look like, but we know it's going to look nothing like this. Absolutely nothing like this. So this isn't working very well. So let's talk about what we talk about feminism today. Well, radical feminists argue, and the core of this is that women exist as a class. And I think Dworkin put it really well. The fate of every individual woman, no matter what her politics, character, values, quality, is tied to the fate of all women, whether she likes it or not. Yes. We are all in this sinking ship together. But I do not want to deny my privilege as a white, educated woman. All women have targets on their back. The poorer you are, the more of colour you are, the bigger the bullseye. Right, that's absolutely, we've all got that target on our back, but some women have a bigger bullseye than others. And it is incumbent upon those of us who have been given the goodies of patriarchy to fight even harder for those who have been systematically denied the goodies of patriarchy. To this, feminism is something individual to each woman. So think about the previous idea that we exist as a class. Think about this as an individual. The question is what happened between the so-called two waves? And if you want to know what happened between the two waves, then you have to bring these two into the picture. <laughs> okay, so they were key, absolutely key. Now, what they did is they normalised, glorified and institutionalised neoliberalism. Which what neoliberalism is, is the argument, again, there is no such thing as society, only individual men and women. The key to neoliberalism is the idea that individuals are sovereign. 
There is no class, gender, race system. You are unencumbered by any inequality. You're an individual, go girl, lean in, do what you have to do, because it's only up to you. And again, she sounds like Margaret Thatcher now. Can you see this? This is the problem with a lot of third wave feminists. And I'm not really blaming them, but I want to say that what has happened is they have internalized neoliberalism without understanding what they've internalized. That their philosophies go unexamined. Now, today's battleground is radical feminism versus neoliberal. And neoliberalism is really capitalism on steroids, okay? <laughs> it's a whole new way of the sovereignty of the individual. So in neoliberalism, let's be very clear, there is no analysis of structural inequality, there's no analysis of systems of oppression, and there's no groups with collective interests. And that includes, by the way, the oppressed and the oppressor. So here is the absolute lie of neoliberalism. We are all individuals. There are no classes and no groups. But let me ask you a question. When these one percenters get together at Davos and all of these places, what do you think they talk about? What they had for dinner last night? They act as a group with collective interests. It's just us without any power are meant to be the ones who don't have class interests. It is such a clever lie. They know full well the Bill Gates of the world and all of that. They understand this. They've read Marx. They get their class interests, and they get that they have to operate as a class to keep the 1% of the goodies. Meanwhile, they own all the media that tells us that there's no such things as classes. And the incredible thing in the United States is if you argue against poverty, you are basically accused of class warfare. Do you know that? To call the rich rich is a form of class warfare. Yes, that's how it's gotten to in the States. Now. <coughs> When it, this is the problem now exactly with third wave feminism. Because they have taken on the neoliberal position, they do not see men as a class with the collective interests. So men are actually the disappeared of third wave. Third wave feminists talk about women all the time. It's as if porn is made by women, for women, for the enjoyment of women. Where are men in all of this? Right? Men appear nowhere in the discussion. Except, you know, it's men who make porn, it's men who jerk off to porn, it's men who get rich from porn, and porn, where are they? So, they've really taken this seriously, the disappeared. So let's give an example of the disappeared. So you all remember this twerking, okay? So what happened the day after is who do you think they all came after? Her. Let me tell you, the best part of that was his mother, Robbie Thicke's mother the next day saying on television, oh, Miley Cyrus, she's so disgusting. <laughs> I would say, hello, what about your 30-odd-year-old son grinding into a young woman half his age, and do you know he's getting divorced? Who saw that coming? <laughs> now, what happened in third-wave feminism is she, it was argued that we shouldn't be going after Miley because he's slut shame. What the fuck is slut shaming? <laughs> How do you shame a concept that grows out of shame? Slut is in and of itself a concept of shame to police women's behaviour. There is no such thing as a slut. To call a woman a slut is to shame her. of kike shaming. I'm a Jew and you kike shamed me. I mean, can you imagine using the oppressor's term to say that they're shaming you? It is a bizarre concept, slut shaming. What we need to do to understand what happened is put Miley Cyrus in the context of patriarchal capitalism. Now, I don't know Miley Cyrus. None of us do. And in a way, I hate to say it, she's not that interesting for the analysis because Miley Cyrus is come and go. What's interesting is the mass exploitation of young women in a capitalist society where women are either fuckable or invisible. That's what we should be talking about. And if anything, what we should be saying is poor Miley Cyrus, who has a feeding chain of adults who've lived off this kid since she's eight years old. So, Miley Cyrus, 
is ageing out. Let's just talk about this as a commodity. She's a commodity for Disney who creates billions. She ages out of Disney. They have to rebrand her. In comes Annie Lebowitz with the rebranding when she's 16 with the bedhead. That's her father. Would you want to be like that with your father? I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> then a year later, this is her in L. And then now we've got this. Has she been rebranded? Of course she's been rebranded. And you had to rebrand Miley Cyrus, otherwise she wouldn't have been visible in a world of fuckable Lady Gaga, fuckable Beyonce, fuckable Rihanna, fuckable all these women who are out there who have to look a certain way, who if they choose not to, are invisible in this world. And that is the reality of the world that this woman lives in. And to blame her for one second is absolutely ludicrous. And yesterday we were having a conversation over dinner, some of us, about whether Beyonce is a feminist. I'll tell you when Beyonce is a feminist. She is a feminist when Jay-Z stands there with a little thing around where you can see his testicles hanging out and she is fully clothed. That's when Beyonce is a feminist. Not when she's standing there with barely any clothes on while your husband is fully clothed and fully protected. It's absolutely outrageous, this. So, let's move on to this now and say how this maps on to the porn wars, the neoliberalism and the porn wars. So, let's begin with this big porn, which is a new book out recently from um, Spinifex Press, which is based on <laughs> radical feminism. And let's just remember, for a moment, who was the founder of this. Without Andrea Dworkin, I and many of us who are anti-porn would be looking at pornography still today and thinking, you know what, I don't like this, but I don't know why. She gave us the template, the understanding. Why do we have Marxists, Faberians, Foucauldians? Why are there no walking eyes? Notice we never name a school of thought after a woman. Right? Their ideas are never important to name a school. She said, think about pornography as a new institution of social control. A democratic use of terrorism against all women, not some women, all women. A way of saying to every woman, look down, bitch, because when you look up, you're going to see your legs spread. That was what feminism was about. There was a day I remember when you could believe that if a woman called herself a feminist, she was going to be anti-porn. Those days are gone. And I think with that, in the end, we, feminism is going to go. Unless we can all agree that pornography is about violence against women, where no woman should live like that, where we as women who do not have to live like that have an absolute obligation to fight that structure and tear it down brick by brick. Unless we believe on that, what is our movement about? I don't know anymore. which some of you might have seen, which is basically um, two people who edited it, both, well, there's quite a few of them, all very, very pro-porn. Two of these women now run porn studies. Have you heard of this journal? Absolute embarrassment <coughs> to the academy that you have a journal that is run by people who make no attempt at any critical analysis. And they use, a lot of them argue, similar to Joanna Angel, who calls herself a feminist pornographer, I want to make something very clear. If you make pornography and you have a vagina, that does not make you a feminist pornographer. You need more than a vagina to be a feminist. Now, Joanna Angel has said, you could do a porn where a girl is getting choked and hit and spit on. The guy's calling you a dirty slut and stuff, and that can still be feminist as long as everybody there is in control of what they're doing. This is the insanity we have gotten to today. And it's not going to be enough for us to say we disagree with this. It is, has to be a serious, compelling argument against this. Now, let me give you an example of what happened to me when I wrote Pornland. So I wrote Pornland, which I wrote from a radical feminist perspective, which was post-internet, looking at the business of the industry, looking at the way they target young boys specifically to become early porn users, looking at the way that women are used in porn, my partner put it really well. He says, pornography is like a butcher shop. They use every piece of the woman so there's nothing left to waste. 
That's exactly what pornography is. The complete use and abuse of a woman. So I write this book. The worst review I get is in Ms. Magazine, the oldest feminist magazine. It was on their website, actually. That was the worst review by a woman called Shira Tarrant. Now, Shira Tarrant interviews me, and I go through the stupid me, the institutional analysis and how porn works. And what does she do to argue against me? Does she argue that, no, this is not an institution grounded in capitalist patriarchy that is raising? No, she interviews one woman in pornography, and basically because that woman says that she has a choice, that discredits everything I say. So in this neoliberal world, one individual can trump an entire critical analysis of institutional oppression. That's the insanity of this. <laughs> then what we get is instead of talking about the conditions of women in porn, the diseases they get, the way they are destroyed physically, because the average woman can only last three months in porn because of what they do to her body. What happens is that a rigorous structural analysis of porn, which I would be happy to say I actually did in Pornland, gets reduced to musings about assumed individual choice of assumed individual performers. Again, feminism is to every individual woman what she wants it to be. If she says it's okay, and we know nothing about these women who say porn is okay, they are in porn, they have to make a living, they don't have much choice. What are they going to say with their pimp or their suitcase pimp standing next to them? I hate this. These guys are fuckers. They destroy me. Every time I go on that set, I come away with greater PTSD. What are they going to say? Circle back to that woman five years after she's been out of porn, you'll hear a very different story. So an example I use in my book, I go into this, especially the racism in porn. Because what they do in porn, very interestingly, is they harness racist ideologies to make porn even more sizzling. So if she is a woman of colour, not only is she a debased cunt, she's a debased cunt of colour. Do you understand what you can do with that? Fucking black cunt, fucking Latino cunt, fucking... I mean, you've got no end of the way that you bring together the way that you bring racism and sexism together. And when you can debase her doubly, then you've really got the sizzle in porn. That's why racism in porn is so crucial. So this is what I did. I gave an example of ghetto gaggers. I have to tell you, I am desensitised to porn. I have seen more porn than any human being should. This <laughs> makes me crazy. I can almost dissociate when I see it. It is so violent. It is black women, white men. The stuff they do to this, these women are unbelievable. And I quote this. Vixen is a sassy, ghetto, fabulous bitch with more attitude than Harlem has crap. She needs a learning by some white cocks. And let me tell you, as they're saying this, they've got her head in the toilet, they're flushing it, and they're anally penetrating it. Okay, this is the level of violence in porn. This is how bad it is. I and mean, if those of you who come to Portland uh, during lunchtime, it's a 33-minute film. There's not that many images, but the images in it, I want to make very clear, are the images that a 12-year-old boy gets to in 15 seconds. If you can't stand it, Imagine what it's like for him, and then the girls he's going to date. So we need to know what's in porn. That is absolutely central. As awful as it is, we need to know what's in it. Anyway, then, after I give this analysis in my book, what does Shira Tarrant do? She goes and interviews a woman of colour, Cinnamon Love, who is a porn performer, and she talks about how, in fact, we now have women of colour in porn that showcases the sexuality and beauty of women of colour. Notice again how an individual analysis completely and utterly trumps. So Tarrant's argument then, she then has the cheat to say that my uh, generalisations about porn being sexist and racist, my generalisations are irresponsible and dangerous. <laughs> Not John's, not pimps, not that fucker who's got the woman's head down the toilet. He's not dangerous and irresponsible. I am. Again, this is the insanity of where we're at. Now, Tarrant's critique, like most critiques of coming from the third wave, 
basically ignores the historical roots of racism as a founding material and representational reality in the US. You cannot talk about the United States of America without talking about how racism was its very founding movement. Moreover, he ignores the nature of systematic, systemic racism and she ignores the way it affects people of color today in the United States. Instead, she quotes Cinnamon Love after 200 years of this. And just incredible. So what about the men? When we interview porn directors, what they say about the men in porn is that they want even harder porn, porn that they can't keep up with the fans. So let's talk about what they want, these guys. And you don't have to go very far to find out. This is from an adult DVD discussion board. This is Hot Boy. He says, I love the hardcore face fucking, the women drooling, the gagging, the puke scenes. They actually talk about what they want. There's no shortage of this. They go on and on. These aficionados of porn talk to each other about what they like. And then another example. This is one where they're talking about vomit scenes. And one guy says, does anyone know anything? Because, you know, a standard act in porn is they put the penis so far down the throat that she chokes and, in some case, vomits. So someone says, does anyone know anyone? Oh, if you like it roughest, it could be Jessica's scene. At one point, she stops the scene crying. If you like vomit, go for baby doll. And I went on baby doll and agreed uh, she actually vomits. And they keep it in the scene. They don't even take it out of the scene. That's the level of which. How many of you knew it was that violent? And how many knew that I'm talking about mainstream? This is not the violent. I don't go near the violent. This is what is on when you put porn into Google. This is what you come up with. Without money. This is the breadcrumbs of a 12-year-old I follow. So this is the reality. Now, the same thing with sex work. When you talk about sex work, what you focus on is the woman, again, there's no men, it's the woman decontextualized from the economic, political, and legal context of buying sex. So in sex work, when you talk about that, what you notice is you see lots of women, but cars. Evidently, it's cars buying women. Did you know that? <laughs> Not men, right? It's all lots and lots of cars are the problem. Well, these are the problem. These guys need something to buy These guys are the problem. So next time you use the word sex work, remember what you're doing. You're legitimizing the John and the Pim. You're legitimizing the buying of women. And what you are doing is you are making invisible the violence done to women. It is not sex work. It's not like I do gray work going to university and she does sex work. It is sexual slavery. And I understand the impulse not to dehumanize these women. We absolutely need not to do that. But the way not to do that is to have a society where nobody has to sell themselves physically like that in order to make money. Yes. That's how you do it. Now we get back to radical feminism. And remember this wonderful quote from Robin Morgan. And what she says is that radical feminism was not a wing or a toe of the left or anything else. It was something entirely different, completely different. So let's remember who we are. Let's remember whose shoulders we stand on and why we have to throw the pie in his face. <laughs> So when I looked for standing on shoulders on Google Images, this is what I got. <laughs> this is what it means for women to stand on women's shoulders. Well, actually, no. So I had to go and sort of figure out how to change this because, of course, we don't want this. So I want to say every single one of us stands here on the shoulders of the most incredible and brave women who went before us. I don't know how they did this, because we do have some community of feminists. They did this, a lot of them, alone against the horrors of what was going on at the time. Let's remember who they are. They are the women's liberation movement, the civil rights movement, who really put women organizing at the top of the civil rights movement and had to fight against a lot of the guys who said that women come later. But they understand.
So, when you say when you come later, later never happens, so you have to start right at the beginning. We have to remember the women who did it for voting. We have to remember those who went violence against women. And look at that nice little motif where we're all standing on the shoulders. We have to remember the wonderful women from Object and all the other women who fought against experts. We have to remember all of those women all over the world who are fighting for equality, where death is a potential if you fight for that. The basic health rights that we take for granted, like turning on the tap, these women, we stand on their shoulders, and we stand on their shoulders because the only way we are going to tie the monster of patriarchy down is the same as Gulliver. We use the Gulliver strategy. Patriarchy is not going to go with one law or one action. It is going to go with lots and lots and lots of things. We need thousands of strings to tie this monster down. There's not one string. The only way you tie a patriarchy down, this monster, is not by feminism being individual to each woman. It's about remembering we are all in this together. Those of us who have more resources, those of us who were lucky to be born in certain that it's pure luck, because remember, there but for the grace of the goddess goes any one of us as poverty stricken and having to basically do survival sex. Those of us who are lucky enough, we do the most work to tie these strings down. That is our job. Without tying those strings down, we are left to live in a world that they have created. A world that, as Mary Daly once said, is a necrophilia world because it loves death. We have to reclaim our world to one that loves life, that loves joy, that loves women, and along with women always come children. Remember that women will never leave their children behind. So we have to rethink what this means. And I want to end by once I was being asked when I was talking about closing the porn industry down, and he said to me, Gail Dines, are you not basically pushing a boulder up a hill? And I wonder what he said if I wanted to say I want to close patriarchy down. That's lots and lots of boulders. But you know what? We can do this. We are unstoppable as a group. We refuse to be scared by these guys because you know what? They're bullies. And bullies crumble when you look them in the face. As a group. And as today. You are here today. And I will say for our daughters, if you think this is bad now, what is it going to be like for our daughters? And I also have a horse in this race because I have a son. And I think my son is worth more than the shit patriarchy tells me what he is. He's worth more than that as well. So, for our sons, for our daughters, for ourselves, for the planet, for all of this, we have to fight in ways. And what Andrea Dworkin once said is so true. The thing that patriarchy takes away from women is the very thing we need the most to fight it, which is courage. The courage comes from being together. And this togetherness, this sisterhood, feminism is not individual to each woman. It is this collective movement. It is what you have in this room. It is what we all feel together. It is what we feel right now when we sit next to each other and we breathe a sigh of relief and we say, you know what? I'm not alone. I'm not going mad. I have a community, and we are all in this together. Thank you. Woo!